and suddenly gold and silver are just out of the picture. And in the silver side, the theory is that bit Bitcoin silver dies while Bitcoin flies. At the end of the silver psyop theory, Bitcoin dies and silver flies. And with Jamie Dimon on camera yesterday saying, if I was the government, I would shut it down. That fulfilled because I said that Bitcoin would be wrecked by the very people who created it in order for them to bring in the control coins that they control. Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So this is a first in a series of end of the year or Christmas or holiday uh, interviews. And, and uh, in this one, I have the pleasure to be speaking with David Morgan, the silver guru from the Morgan uh, Report, and also John Perez, uh, the crypto conspiracy uh, silver uh, psyop guy. Uh, so guys, welcome to the channel. How are you? Thank you, Mario. I'm good. Thank you, Mario. Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas to you, David Morgan. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas to to you too. And uh, maybe we'll start with the uh, with uh, John Perez. You were just telling uh, us uh, before we came on uh, about Shanghai uh, Shanghai gold price and the spot price and what's going on there. You, you seem to have found some kind of uh, link between the two. Something going on. Yeah, well, you know, as you know, silver and gold have been moving east for years now, and it's really accelerated. But it's only been recently that it was a uh, I forgot I forgot his name, the guy's name, uh, uh, Oriental Ghost on Twitter. He posts the Shanghai uh, spot price, so I've I've been watching it for the last few months, and just kind of keeping an eye on it and just watching the parallels. And I started watching the spread. All of a sudden, got wider and wider and wider, and it was going up twenty cents. 40 cents for a couple of days. And all of a sudden something's going to break here. Anyway. So it fills you that like to watch things, these things here. I was watching the spread here between Shanghai and uh, the uh, COMEX and it got to about a $2 spread and then boom, silver popped up and gold popped up. I said, that was really interesting. So, so I have a theory here that Shanghai may be in the process of testing the waters, getting it out there that they're going to be a player in the industry when it comes to uh, setting the price of gold and silver in the future here. So, cause I don't really expect it to be, you know, a, a press release where they say, well, we're in business now, Shanghai, LBMA, you're out of business here. I think it's going to be a slow progression. These guys are all working together, whether we know this or not, it's my opinion. I believe that they are, but I also believe that uh, in an interview I did with David Morgan last February, I talked about something called the COMEX apocalypse the Russia factor and an underwater situation where the telecommunications cables are cut in the UK and Europe, therefore giving the LBMI guys the excuse to say, Hey, we can't send you COMEX guys our silver reports. We can't report here. Those, those pesky Russians, you know? So I've been kind of watching if that happens here, then the Shanghai, uh, the Shanghai really will take another level of authority if there's a problem between the LBMA and the COMEX reporting numbers that come in a week late, and that's where that cons Russia conspiracy factor came in that I did with David in February of 2023. So now we're getting close because if you do a search on underground telecommunications submarines, you'll see, you'll just type in undersea cables UK and type in Russia and you'll go, whoa, wait a second here. <laughs> Nobody's talking about this. They go, I've been talking about it for a year. And they look, you know, I've always thought, I don't think they want to roll over and say, well, you know, you guys were out of silver. So we're going to let Shanghai run the show now. I think, I think they really need an event, as you know, these geopolitical events and, you know, blaming Russia right now is, um, is very popular. So uh, the Shanghai uh, spread though, I was watching as they were both sitting between 20 and 40 cents separated. And all of a sudden it popped up. To about a dollar ninety, almost two dollars, and I thought, wow, something's going to break here. And sure enough, gold took off. It was gold that took off. Silver moved quickly too, towards twenty six dollars. Hit my hit some numbers I had. I literally had some numbers. They hit under the penny and then pulled back. And then I, I in this nosedive we have right now, the Shanghai went down too. I thought this is interesting because now the Shanghai is is acting and mimicking what the Comex manipulators and suppressors 
uh, do here. So something to look out for you. People like to look at these things here. That's something I picked up on here. So even this morning, when I looked at the Shanghai this morning, uh, usually I look at about 2 a.m. Uh, I noticed that, that well, silver's, so I think it was like three, eight o'clock. I texted something. I go, silver's going down today. He goes, how do you know? I go, just watch. Cause we had a London fix, you know, as usually comes out, I'm not sure what four or 45 in the morning. Yeah. I said, yeah. the Shanghai came down first, then the London fix. I said, there's something going on here. So we might find ourselves in the position where we think, oh, okay, well, the, the spot price is being moved around. China's going to come in there and exercise it. We may find that it's like the Wizard of Oz, at, you know, on one side, it's got a twin brother in Shanghai. So yeah. Got to be prepared for that, you know? Inter interesting you mentioned uh, the underwater cables because I think in the 1800s when they first um, put those cables down there for the telegraph or communications or telephone, uh, one of the reasons they call the exchange rate between the pound and the dollar uh, cable is because of those cables, they you know they could oh. more easily trade the uh, foreign exchange because of that. So that's why cable, you know, the pounds called the uh, dollar, a uh, pound dollar is called cable. So isn't it like interesting that wow, if, if those cables get damaged, you could uh, kind of argue that the uh, FX market in London is finished, and uh, yeah. it started with the cable. Uh, and that's interesting. I, I never, uh, I hadn't heard about these speculations of uh, the Russian, well, the Russians uh, damaging the cables. So uh, <laughs> they, they ate my homework, and now they're. But if you if you type yeah. in Russian Ru undersea Rudy, cables, uh, yeah. Rudy ate my homework. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. It's, it's a, you got a Russian dog over there sitting on the couch. So he's Chinese, actually. <laughs> uh, David, uh, so. Yeah. How do you see all, all this uh, situation where, you know, not only silver moving east, but also gold the last two years, record amount of uh, gold buying. And it looks like uh, this year is the same. And I also noticed that uh, back in September, the the gold spot price spread to Shanghai was like one hundred and twenty dollars. And then we saw a, a big move up in, in October. So yeah, uh, I'll uh, let you uh, answer that uh, now, David. Sure, Mario. Uh, <clears throat> I forget the author's name, but he writes Gold Fix, and he probably has more than one author. He did a pretty good dissertation on uh, exactly what John and you have outlined, that this spread in Shanghai is getting more and more power. And of course, it's really the physical market, although we are all so burnt out on what happens in the futures markets. But uh, that I don't think is going to go on forever. Uh, the point is, as you said, Mario, that the real metals have moved east for years. And this is something that's a really big geopolitical event, because if you look at how, you know, follow the money, the money flows, you see whoever owns the gold basically also has the productive capacity, meaning true capitalism. Austrians look at, at production as being capital, not necessarily a stockpile of money, even honest money. So the big producer, even though it was through colonies mostly, was Great Britain. The sun never shined, uh, always shined on Great Britain. <clears throat> well, after the war, it became America, and America produced everything. And now China pretty much produces everything, and they've gotten the lion's share of the gold and probably hold a, a great deal more than uh, they, they report. Uh, in fact, Dominic Frisbee, a friend of mine there in the UK, has, has written about that here recently as well. I'd like to just jump ship a little bit, and if I could just talk about the Silver PSYOP, uh, because John brought this to me, and um, I contemplated whether I'd even do it. And uh, it was kind of like now or never. It was like kind of putting me in the corner, like, well, big boy, you know, are you going to come through with your, all, you know, your true colors? Or are you just going to, you know, whitewash the conspiracy? So we called a conspiracy from the get go. We've agreed on that. And then, you know, so much money that would have gone into the gold and silver arena went into this crypto space. I mean, that's the essence of the conspiracy. And when John got done, and we did 30 of them, not all of them with John, I interviewed a lot of different people, 
And uh, you could draw your own conclusion, but we have lots of not only circumstantial evidence, but hard fact that point in that direction. I said, well, how much of an effect does it have? And when I looked at it versus gold, it could have an effect, but there's only about 10% of the gold market. So you could say it could have a 10% or a multiplier of that. You can't get an exact number, but I wanted to get relative size of the market capitalization of gold versus the crypto space. But when you face it against silver, it have a huge effect on it because the silver market is so much smaller than the gold market that any nickel that went into crypto instead of silver really could detract from what we'll call the non-manipulated price of silver. So I just want to get that out there because a lot of people are probably being introduced to John for the first time, Mario, and he's certainly an out-of-the-box thinker. His site or his Telegram channel is Silver's Money. And he's been not only a good friend to me, but uh, anytime I need a, a quick update on the geopolitical side, which I do look at, but not to the level that John does, I'll call him up. He always gives me his time and says, hey, David, and it gives me a, a quick briefing. So I'm not missing any, any of the big pictures. So I'll give it back to you, Mario. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting you uh, talked about the PSYOP because I uh, started looking into uh, gold in 2002 because I bought my first Kruger Rands back in 2002 at 222 pounds and 45 pence. Now it's around 1600, <laughs> but that's not the point. The, the point is that it made me look into gold uh, and then silver, you know, and prior to that, I was ready uh, into the Austrian School of Economics. I read the Mises web website every day, uh, Lou Rockwell. Uh, I went to the Mises Institute uh, 20th anniversary in 2002. So uh, I was really into it. And uh, I could tell that from, I still worked in finance from up until, well, 2012. So I could see, uh, you know, after Bernanke made that speech in 02, that uh, the US government has the, the free technology, you know, that technology to just produce dollars for free and that there would never be deflation. When I uh, read that speech that came out, I think it was November 02, it convinced me, you know, this system is not going to hold up in the long term. And uh, lo and behold, you know, in 08, 09, it collapsed. And I think a lot of people started uh, looking at the system. I, I know loads of people uh, who never looked into gold or money or silver that did after that. And, and I think... Uh, the powers that be knew that was going to happen. And uh, it's probably one of the reasons why they came up with uh, Bitcoin and crypto at the time, because they wanted to get people looking the other way, not at gold and silver. And even I, you know, thought it was an interesting concept, Bitcoin. I, I got in involved in some Bitcoin trading in 2012. Uh, and, um, the reason why I'm saying this is that recently this this year, a few months ago, I got contacted by a, a guy in the UK that used to work for the FCA, which is like the SEC equivalent in the two, early 2000s. And he, he used to be in charge of uh, running the risk um, systems. And his boss was Andrew Bailey of the Bank of England. And he rem remembers, he told me in 04, they were already talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And then uh, everyone started talking about it at, at the where he worked. And then all of a sudden, his bosses uh, came and said, oh, we need to forget about Bitcoin and that stuff. And they were apparently told that by the SEC in the U.S., and I, when I was communicating with this guy, when we were doing it through email, um, I said, well, but Bitcoin only started in, I think, 08, 09. I'm not too sure the exact year. And he said, yeah, that's right. It's because it, it was uh, created by these guys. And he told me, you know, because maybe we can move into Jamie Dimon. He said uh, one of the biggest users of uh, Bitcoin are the powers that beat. They hide a lot of their slush funds and there's not just criminals so uh i'll let you uh, answer that uh, <laughs> uh John. well you know what back you know to connecting david morgan on this 
when I first brought this up to the, we went, I went for months, I was communicating and I saw the parallels and you hit the, you hit the nail on the head on the year in 2008, Obama was voted in as president. We were, and it was fine. Let's see. It was six months later, the S and P 500 bottomed at six, six, six. Okay. So now it was in 2008 that the Bitcoin white paper came out anonymous, you know, so, and then in 2008 is when uh, JP Morgan really started manipulating silver. So when I saw that those two came in at the same time, the, the silver psyop theory was that s silver had to basically take a back seat while Bitcoin got pushed up. We had programs like hashtag drop gold, where you had billionaires financing drop gold. Gold is a relic. It's no good. You know, go gold bugs, we sp spray with raid. You know, gold bugs, silver, and silver took off, and in 2011 just just got creamed, and we all know that that was not normal, and it was it when that when it came down, that's when they really started pumping Bitcoin, and really, and essentially, an entire generation of of millennial investors who normally would be in in something else speculative went into Bitcoin, where you could see memes where people were suddenly everyone was a Bitcoin millionaire driving around Lamborghinis, and suddenly. Gold and silver are just out of the picture. And in the silver side, the theory is that Bit Bitcoin, silver dies while Bitcoin flies. At the end of the silver psyop theory, Bitcoin dies and silver flies. And with Jamie Dimon on camera yesterday saying, if I was the government, I would shut it down. That fulfilled because I said that Bitcoin would be wrecked by the very people who created it in order for them to bring in the control coins that they control. You could press a few buttons. You didn't have to work hard. There was no worth work ethic, you know? And of course it was freedom. It was everything that gold was supposed to be. Bitcoin was portrayed as a gold coin, which was another, everything about Bitcoin is it's disguised with gold, which is to replace it. So for me, it appeared to be a PSYOP that was state sponsored. And, um, and as I dug more into this, you know, it, it was obvious that the, that Epstein was involved with MIT, the money going back there. I mean, we covered all this. And you going even to Tether, even Tether, the first CEO of Tether, is direct network to J Jeffrey Epstein. Now, seeing at this, at 08, you've got JP Morgan manipulating silver, which we know. And all of a sudden, who's the banker for Jeffrey Epstein? It's JP Morgan. This is open source information. So, it's, and I said in the silver sign, I said, Sorry to interrupt you. Oh. Epstein also worked for Bear Stearns, who That's right. took over in 08, and they had a huge silver yes. position too. That's right. So now, uh, suddenly, what, 2014, suddenly Bitcoin's taken off. The silver people, 2012, the silver people are wiped out. Stocks crashing, gold companies going out of business, losing everything while Bitcoin's taking off. And suddenly... Gold and silver are just out of the picture. And in the silver side, the theory is that bit, Bitcoin, silver dies while Bitcoin flies. At the end of the silver psyop theory, Bitcoin dies and silver flies. And with Jamie Dimon on camera yesterday saying, if I was the government, I would shut it down. That fulfilled because I said that Bitcoin would be wrecked by the very people who created it in order for them to bring in the control coins that they control. But in the, the last, what, we've had nine years, really 10 years, where people have become addicted to crypto. The idea of getting rich by buying crypto now is, it's embedded now. People think it's freedom. But at the end of the day, there's nothing backing Bitcoin. People say technology, like John McAfee said, you know, all the criminals had Bitcoin first. It's a tracking device. People don't know this. And there are other governments above this who have backdoor access to all these coins here. So at the end of the silver stop, which I believe right now, when Jamie Dimon came on in court and testified that if he was the government, he would shut it down. I thought, okay, he's gonna, I, I think he's gonna be our next treasury secretary here and he's gonna shut it down. So, cause why? Because he said, he said it's for criminals, money laundering, drug trafficking, and Elizabeth Warren says crypto and terrorism, all the key buzzwords to shut it down. Cause why? Cause the government hates competition. They want to control, they're not going to, you know, now they, they went, what, eight, nine, 10 years where they, since 2008, they looked the other way, 
anonymous coin. You know, if you and I, now they're shutting everyone, all these B Bitcoin millionaires dead, dying left and right, dead, 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 dead. Every exchange being shut down, biggest exchanges, Binance. And right now I'm literally watching the silver side act completely fulfill itself and that crypto are going to go away. And then they're going to bring in another coin here because they got everyone on the hook now because it's about it's the control grid. Once you are stuck on that money, you're not going to pay. You ate two cheeseburgers this week. Next week you get one cheeseburger. You know, it's, it's about control. And that's why, you know, everyone wants to have physical silver and gold. So we're literally watching in what I, in my opinion is the end of the silver psyop where again, back to 2008, it was silver up then down. And at the end, I've always said this Bitcoin dies, silver flies. Jamie Dimon, when he came out and said that, man, I, I nearly fell out of my chair. I said, there it is. There it is. This is fulfillment. It's, it's not Trump doing it because Trump tweeted out in 2017 that Bitcoin was thin air and crypto led to illegal activity. If you look at that, his specific tweet, the activities he listed were almost verbatim the same activities that Jamie Dimon listed. I, I went and pulled up that old tweet. It was five years, six years old. And I said, this is funny. I looked at the transcript of Jamie Dimon and Trump. I said, so my conspiracy, so I said, this is all scripted. This is going to happen here. Bitcoin's good. And now I have the videotape. 2,000 people looked at it. They've already got it in place using, if Epstein's involved with Bitcoin, Bitcoin's not a currency. It's a piece of property. So it's kind of like a, a gun that was dropped. Somebody else picked it up and shot it. It becomes evidence and it can be seized as a non-currency in a, crime scene, if Jeffrey Epstein's connected with Bitcoin, which he is, then executive order 13818 uh, becomes, it comes into play because it's about human trafficking. And in executive order 13818 is they embedded what's in there called the Magnitsky Act. And that is they can go through all extradition laws, any country sees whoever they want, whatever they want, whenever they want. And that's government. And when Jamie Dimon said, if I were the government, I would shut it down. You know, now of course now you turn on YouTube channels right now and everyone's screaming and yelling about Jamie Dimon, you know, and JP Morgan, billions and billions in fine. We know this is a, we know JP Morgan is the most crooked bank in the world and Jamie Dimon, it, they're in there. Well, people need to realize and remember that Jeffrey Epstein is the first Bitcoin billionaire. If you go to Cointelegraph 2017, he gives his interview there. He said, Bitcoin has all the potential in the world. He gives the entire sales pitch. And a lot of people don't know that they're quoting Jeffrey Epstein. And guess who his banker was? JP Morgan here. So you got one group of people say, oh, yeah, JP Morgan is evil. Jamie Dimon is evil. It's like, well, that was Epstein's banker. And by the way, Epstein is connected with Bitcoin. So this is really, it's a it's coming back to circle. It's going to collide and, I, and in my opinion, I think Jamie Dimon, I wouldn't be, he's either going to be go away or he's going to be the U.S. Treasury Secretary and he's going to execute what he said in court. If I was the government, I would shut it down because J.P. Morgan has their own coin and it's about control. So that's that's kind of a summary of the silver psyop. So when that Bitcoin dies, I think it's going to it's, it's going to be connected very close to the Ukraine surrender. Ukraine's about ready to write a surrender. There'll be no negotiations with Russia. And there's some connections there between Bitcoin and Ukraine. A lot of weapons were purchased using Bitcoin. A lot of people don't know this story people don't want to talk about. But I get it. You know, certain, certain things you don't want to talk about. But uh, that's the end of the silver psyop. So, so Jamie Dimon yesterday in court, we all know that's crooked. We all know the fines are there. But him making that statement that was parallel to what Trump tweeted out about Bitcoin, literally verbatim here. I thought this right here, this is all scripted here. So I don't see the future for Bitcoin. Everyone's pumping it up here. It's this is what happens. It's, it's, so Bitcoin will probably do what silver did in 2011, shot up to $50 and then pff, rug pull. But if you own physical silver and gold, you're just going to be saying, hey, this is why we have physical silver and gold. You know, it's there's nothing backing Bitcoin. And as uh, John McAfee said, it's just it's old technology. And it was used for tracking. And as you said, and if if it's track, if it's used for hiding money, well, how do you track all your criminal? You know, if you got 500 CEOs, you know, blackmailed and you control your money, how do you do it? 
you give them the cryptocurrencies. And what happens? We know what you're doing. So the next time you get out, you're going to tell everyone how great Bitcoin is, you know? So there's a lot of clandestine blackmail stuff here and it goes higher here. There's, there's more to that story here, but, uh, it's too hot for YouTube. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to pass it on to David, but before I do, I'd like to say, I, I think the other reason, uh, they pushed crypto onto the like, uh, millennials or to young people, uh, back in 08 was that they would, uh, do all the work for them in terms of programming, developing the uh, technology. So they've gotten um, a lot of things, you know, the infrastructure for a central bank digital currency uh, for free. You, you kind of uh, yeah. <laughs> think. And the other thing um, is uh, that I wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah. Uh, the I remember you said that gold... You know, Bitcoin was always a gold coin. And I remember also Litecoin was supposed to be silver. But uh, what I wanted to ask David, uh, David, how do you think uh, once Bitcoin dies, how do you think that's going to affect the silver market? Uh, I guess once the uh, silver psyop dies. Yeah, uh, great question. I mean, the truth is, I don't know, but I really do suspect that... Uh, that we'll see a move into silver and gold. I've uh, made the bold statement, and I'm not afraid to make them, Mario, as you well know. I know you followed my work for a while. And that is that the next big move in the crypto space will be asset-backed digital currencies. Well, what are asset-backed digital currencies? Well, primarily they're gold and silver, but they can be cobalt. They could be real estate. They could be uh, an automobile company, for crying out loud. But this idea that crypto is a solution when it's backed by nothing but somebody's promise to pay nothing, in other words, it's uh, electronic fiat, is worthless. And that hasn't really come into the consciousness of a lot of the people in Bitcoin, primarily I'm not picking on, I'm just saying I have two millennial daughters, but a lot of the millennials, it's like, you know, it's a nifty, hot, need to have kind of a thing. But a lot of them are waking up, you know, what's the true value of this? And um, I do think that we could get in a situation where you see a lot of these unbacked cryptos fall away and at the same time a run into uh, the asset-backed digital currencies. When I was asked long ago, I think it was 2014, John may help me out, a lot of people that trust me and, you know, I'm a human, I'm imperfect, but... I'm trustworthy for the most part. David, what's your opinion on Bitcoin? Bitcoin, Bitcoin. So I wrote a paper, and it's still out there on the web somewhere, called My Two Bits About Bitcoin. And I said, if it really takes off, the government is going to come in because they want to keep the monopoly. They're not going to give it away. And then I also said, because I talked to Richard Grove, that he thought that the NSA might have had something to do with it. Well, as the facts have, have been revealed to us, and one of the things that John and I did in the Crypto Conspiracy series was go to Graph Commons and show all the vectors off of some of the main players, particularly MIT, and all surrounding uh, well-known personalities like Tether that connect to Bitcoin. It really makes you scratch your head, even if you've never seen that before. Once you see that, you can't erase it. But coming back on point, I think that it's more of a controlled opposition than I've, I've felt in the past. Get a lot of flack for that because a lot of people, especially the maxis, that Bitcoin is more valuable than gold. I mean, can you tell me that a software program is more valuable than something you know that's been money for 5,000 years? I just don't see it. But the last point, Mario, is that I think we're getting ready for the shift. The bankers know the system's broken. They need a substitute system. They want to maintain control. And the easiest, best, and most programmed way, meaning mentally programmed, is go into a CBDC. Um, Bitcoin and others are untrustworthy. We never thought it could be hacked. It's been hacked. The Russians came in and ruined Bitcoin. They're stealing your Bitcoin out of your wallet. We got to do something get out now and get into our safe and secure central bank digital currency. You'll be so happy you did. That's the, that's the main meme. 
Before I pass it on to you, John, again, I just want to make a few comments. One about Tether. I mean, I, I've known for the last three years that Tether is not 100% backed by uh, <laughs> Federal Reserve notes. That is uh, about 3%, but people still seem to just ignore it. And, and they, they see, the company there, I think it's in Bermuda, they've never done an independent audit. And it just seems right. to be the, uh, the way that they... Uh, it's like the Federal Reserve for for Bitcoin. They just pump pump yes. uh, the crap out of uh, Bitcoin with it. Uh, <laughs> excuse my French. But the other thing about uh, that David uh, said that I thought was uh, interesting, uh, because I I I, I was um, you know, on this channel up until 2017. I uh, I did talk a lot about Bitcoin, uh, other cryptos. I thought it was something good to have. Uh, Bitcoin and crypto and gold and silver. But when uh, I saw that they started, uh, they created, I think, uh, futures on the CBOE and CBOT on, on uh, crypto, I thought, oh, this is, you know, uh, crypto or Bitcoin is supposed to be uh, uh, an alternative to the financial system that we had. And now we had Goldman Sachs getting involved. And I thought, mm, I don't like that. So I decided then, you know, that I would just focus on gold and silver. Uh, and, but coming back to you, John, I wanted to ask you now, get back on the geopolitical side, because David said you covered geopolitics a lot. Uh, we saw a couple of days ago that um, uh, President Putin was, was uh, you know, warmly welcome, not just in the UAE, but in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. And there's a photo yesterday people were showing uh, him introducing the head of the Russian Central Bank to uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman or MBS. And a lot of people said, well, there's gold, you know, there's the oil, there's the deal. Uh, and with what uh, John, uh, sorry, David said about uh, maybe uh, tokens, like asset backed tokens, uh, what what's your view on what's going on with the BRICS and, and uh, gold and maybe uh, who knows uh, some kind of settlement currency backed by gold? Yeah, this this is how I see it. That's that's really important because I mean it's not often you go traveling. You remember he flew into Saudi Arabia and he was surrounded by uh, fully armed Su thirty fighter jets, you know, and with Saudi Arabia, which is an ally of the United States. So he didn't just fly on a plane. He came in with fully armed Su-35s, which is very unusual here. And offshore in the Persian Gulf was, and remains there, the USS Eisenhower. And remember, he's got a warrant for his arrest from the ICC, International Criminal Court here. So there's a lot of symbolic things that were happening here as a backdrop there. Now, back to your point, I believe what, what, what I believe there was a deal signed there. Uh, I believe Saudi Arabia and China and Russia, they're, Saudi Arabia is right in the center between Russia and China, China being a big oil consumer and both Russia and Saudi being the biggest oil producers here. They're good. I believe they're going to go, they're going to go onto the Russian swift system. And this is going to include Venezuela down the road. Venezuela has already got the mirror system there. And we're going to see some military action happen there very soon. It's going to be in the news with Venezuela regarding Guyana and the U S but regarding the central bank there, I believe that the, the deal was made there. And that was a symbolic photograph. I think it was meant to be seen there that Ben Salman is officially cut off from the U S petrodollar, And that's why he's there in, being introduced to the central bank president of Russia, who she has done a fabulous job amongst all these sanctions to run the country. But also at the same time, a lot of people don't know that there's been all these sanctions against Russia, but the largest importer of oil and energy to Europe is actually Russia brokered through India, who sells their oil to India and India sells it back to Europe. So Russia still remains the largest provider of energy to Europe. It's just that their oil gets brokered through India with a big discount here. That just came out this morning. So in my opinion, and this is, I'm gonna extend this even farther. I believe we're going to see Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Syria go onto a local oil currency, something I talk about a lot. And Iraq's got to be very, very careful because they, they've got 
the green zone in there. You can see the green zone, it's being attacked now. You're starting to see more of these attacks on uh, American bases, same in Syria and Iraq. You can see that the entire Arab world, they're moving. Uh, you don't see it in the news. I see it. They're moving against the Americans who are in Syria stealing oil and the Americans that are left in Iraq. You know, uh, Russia just took over the second largest oil field in Iraq last week. And China has the largest control of oil field in Iraq. And there's going to be a DNR reset. It's going to be similar to Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia is going to set the tone where the being purchasing oil from Saudi Arabia will be done in the local currency. In other words, it will be the Saudi, the real on a dig on a digital basis. It'll be digital where Chinese purchase, but it'll be transacted in Saudi reals. Russians, It'll be Saudi rials and rubles digitally. That model, I believe they're going to begin that model. When we see that model execute, which I believe is it started yesterday, it's probably already in place because the Russian SWIFT system, they began in 2014. That model there, I believe that model is going to happen in Iraq. And I, I believe that the, the Iraqi dinar, which is a speculative position some people have, is that there's people talk about a reset. When the reset happens on the Iraqi dinar, it will be connected to the reset of the value of oil because their current, their entire economy is dependent on the value of oil. And it's the same with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has these big visions on a, a vision 2030, but it's based on 90, $95 oil. Well, they keep cutting oil, keep cutting, but oil keeps going down. There's a war going on to keep that oil suppressed so that the Americans are still paying for cheap oil and Biden stays in office, but yet the Saudis are cutting, the Russians are cutting, and oil keeps going down, which is not normal here. So what's going to break it? They've got they to break away. They've got to break away from the petrodollar and execute an actual transaction that completely excludes the dollar out of the transaction. And I believe that when uh, that was signed yesterday or when two to, in the last 48 hours, and this morning, the Iranian president is in Moscow right now. I believe they're executing the same thing here for transaction with Iran. And of course, if that happens, you've got the American carriers in the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf. And we saw what happened with Saddam Hussein and this talk about Lindsey Lindsey Graham blowing up all the Iranian oil platforms. That is definitely all still in the cards there. So it's a very complex what you see here. But to your point, that deal, I believe, is a it's a digital system it's a russian swift system where they transact in saudi currencies because a minute symbolically this happens which i say a week after kissinger dies symbolically to the world it's going to show that the u.s petrodollar is officially dead the saudis are transacting without the u.s dollars with the russians who have the weapons and war and the chinese who are the big consumers and i believe that is going to be i believe that's going to be a, a that's going to be, that's like the economic World War III. That's like a nuclear financial move that the whole world will be watching. And all these countries on the sidelines that don't want to make a move because they know they'll be hit with sanctions from the United States, they're sitting back waiting and watching. And especially Iraq, Iraq has to be careful because there's $275 billion in cash being held at the New York Fed that they can use against them like a billy club. So anyhow, a complex discussion they're probably worth listening more than once but i that is that's what i see right now john i just want to add on to that briefly that uh, the united arab emirates announced yesterday that they're not going to settle oil in uh in u.s dollars anymore so a lot's adding up i could add on to the uh, kissinger demise and what that's all about but I, it's really outside of the scope of where mario is leading us but uh yeah, the world revolves around energy, not money. Everyone that says yeah. money makes the world go round. It's energy that makes the world go round. And he who owns the energy is really making the rules. And as you said, John, you've got Russia together with the Saudis or the Middle East, yeah. and you control most of the world's oil. You have a hell of a lot more control than who can print the most pieces of paper. And it's interesting, John, you said, you know, that the Eisenhower Carrier Group is uh is it in the Gulf or Red Sea? I'm not sure. Or in the Mediterranean? Persian Gulf, yes. Per Persian now. 
Uh, but wasn't it sent there? I, I mean, one carrier group or the Gerald Ford was sent there because of uh, what happened in Israel in October. You kind of wonder if, if that was a good excuse for, for them to send it there. And, and they're actually thinking about this petrodollar situation. But maybe, uh, I don't know, David, or, or you could uh, tell uh, the viewers, uh, where do you think gold comes into the equation of this new a uh, BRICS system with uh, the Saudis uh, trading in their own currency or in the ruble or or the yuan. I'll take the lead on this. So if you go back and really look at what happened with Kissinger and the petrodollar, the Saudis were not trusting the U.S. dollar. They really wanted to settle oil and gold, but the the Americans had a different idea. So they sent Kissinger over there and basically. We said, well, we'll give you protection on it. We'll be your big brother and we'll look after you if you settle not only in US, if you settle in US dollars. So they struck that deal. The part of it that no one really talks about very much is they just are making massive amounts of money or dollars. They've taken a gold substitute, the US dollar. And what do you do with them all? Well, the beauty of the system for the elites or for the bankers is you can go into the bond market. So they cycled all of this money, not all, but a great vast amount of it into the U.S. Treasury market. And that's what the movie Rollover was all about. Because what that movie depicted was that the Saudis realized that paper really isn't worth that much in the long run. And so they were taking some of the paper to convert it to gold slowly. I'm a little off track, but the point is, they didn't trust the dollar. They got talked into it. And then the beauty was they could inflate like crazy because once you buy a 30-year bond, it's sterile for 30 years. If you wait until you, you know, those 30 years are up to cash it out. Now, some, of course, are sold, you know, at any because you could sell them at any time and take a premium or a discount, depending on what the interest rate environment is. But this was allowed the US to just just turn on the printing press like crazy. And now my point is, it's coming full circle potentially, which is what you, Mario, myself, and John are talking about. It's like, we don't trust you anymore. Maybe we never did. And now it's back in our house. In our house, we also got the Russians with us. Give us gold or get out of here. And I'm being a bit uh, strong on this, whether it goes that far or not, I don't know. What I do know is that's generally the direction. In other words, the trend has changed dramatically. Whether it's going to be gold or not remains to be determined, but certainly can't be ruled out. That's a certainty. Yeah, and we've seen, I mean, last year, uh, I think was a record amount of gold buying by mostly like emerging markets, China and uh, BRICS countries. Uh, I think it was, yeah, the most since Bretton Woods Agreement. And this year... It's on trend again. Uh, what? How do you see uh, this, uh, John? Well, I think you know. Uh, going back to what, following up what David said, it's important to know that within seven days of Kissinger dying, who was the king of the petrodollar, the gold hit its all-time high. I think that was symbolic. I believe that was a shot across the bow that gold is now the king, and Mister King Petrodollar Kissinger is gone. And I think it was very symbolic. Then right after that, within seven days of Kissinger being gone, Putin flies in with fighter jets, making oil deals here with the two largest oil groups. You got the Saudis and Russians, what David Morgan just said. But let's add more to this. The day after he returned to Russia, the second largest asset holder of Iranian president is in Moscow. So there's going to be a, I'm going to say this right now, there is a new oil cartel coming. Get ready. A new oil cartel is coming here. And it's down the road, if it, if I'm correct here, it's going to include Iraq. And like David said here, they're going to have oil as an asset, but they're going to be making transactions in what is called, the, as you know, the new multipolar world. That in the past, if you did something like this, you were going to get, you know, you got the USS Eisenhower sitting out there as a message, you know, but but the days of of 
uh, projecting power with an aircraft carrier has changed because now there's the technology of hypersonic anti-ship missiles. It changes the game. These ships are vulnerable. And the United States as a government is, is from a public relations standpoint, not prepared to see a, a large ship like this sink, you know, with six or 7,000 people on it from a public relations standpoint. That came in 2015 when Obama was given a red line in Syria and Russia was ready to go and Obama backed down because you, if this, if this country experiences that kind of pain, it's going to recoil back and no more war. And if there's no more war, the military industrial complex, not going to be happy if they can't make money, you know, moving weapons and bombs and using legislation to say, well, if we don't do this, we're going to lose this here. So, uh, Back to what David was saying here with Russia and Saudi Arabia and Kissinger, all these things happen all at once. Like I said, what are the odds of a coincidence happening where Kissinger passes away one week later, all time high for gold? I mean, petrodollar dead, you know, Saudi Arabia, Bin Salman in there running the show here, making a deal, swift ready. And now Iranian president in uh, Moscow, there's, there's not too many options left for the u.s government here we're in debt trillions our market our mark our economies are a mess unemployment numbers are much higher inflation way over what they report there's really not much left here except one thing there's one industry that's flourishing right now and that is the military industrial stocks and companies there and uh, the suppression game of holding down silver and gold is only going to go so far and, I, and i've said this before on my show with david morgan it is going to take a near nuclear event for them to really let go of the price of gold. But when that happens, chances are the central banks record buying again will have all their positions in place. And I mean, it's completely out of the box thinking of what you see on CNBC or all the or Fox Business News here. But that's my position. I believe it's going to be right on the money, though, too. Uh, David, uh, I get a lot of uh, comments uh, when I talk about the BRICS that I'm uh, cheerleading for them. But I'm actually trying to uh, warn people uh, how it's going to affect not just the United States, but the UK and Western Europe. So with that in mind, could you give your opinion or your view on, on how important it is for people to be aware of uh, the, you know, the death of the petrodollar, how it's going to impact them? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, you know, people look after themselves. I mean, most of us are have got you know, the, what I call the preservation instinct, you know, I mean, and so you could take that to the next level and approach to your family, appears to your tribe, your community or whatever. That also goes to the nation state level. So the thing that worried me the most, Mario, way back in the beginning when I, you know, kind of figured out how the whole system works and how the banks get something for nothing what worried me the most was that if you look at all of monetary history, it really was isolated. I mean, the Weimar Republic, you could go to Austria, you could move to Italy. I mean, not that everyone could, but some could. So you could mitigate it somehow, or you could get gold and silver. But this is a worldwide phenomenon. When the dollar goes, everybody goes. Well, that's not really true. With the BRICS, they saw it coming, and they said, look, what, what really makes the world go around is human labor and resources to turn those into products and services. And so they band together and said, we've got to mitigate what's coming. So that's all they've done. This is a natural order of things. It's not a conspiracy. It's not a whatever. It's a community of different countries, like-minded, saying, hey, if we work together, we have a better uh, probability of mitigating the situation because some of us have oil, some of us have you know, platinum group metals. I mean, South Africa is 70% of the world's platinum. Uh, some have good labor uh, forces and agriculture. So they put themselves together in what I would consider a natural way. And what it does is, as I just said, mitigates the demise of the U.S. dollar and gives them a much better fighting chance of overcoming and obfuscating some of the damage that's going to be done by everyone else that believes that the 30-year bond is the safest investment you can make. I mean, there's nothing worse in the world that you could own right now than a 30-year treasury. Yet the markets pretend as if it really <laughs> has some validity. I mean, if the world is a completely upside down, Mario, I just don't know what is. 
Yeah, no, I agree. So, yeah, so they're okay. actually, uh, BRICS are not trying to bring the dollar down, but trying to protect themselves from the collapsing dollar, which uh, you won't hear too much in the mainstream uh, press. Uh, John? Well, you know, to follow up with David Morgan, I mean, uh, if if the if the U.S. dollar was a piece of art, you know, and it was the the Mona Lisa, you get the the dollar here, and and you went somewhere and said, "Oh, I'm going to sell you, you know, a a cop a numbered copy of the Mona Lisa. We only made a hundred of these, you know. I got a numbered piece. You bought number number, uh, you know, seventeen. You bought number seventeen copy of the Mona Lisa." And there's limited version here. And, you know, the Italian government, uh, this government said, okay, that's it. And you bring it home and your friends come over and say, oh, look at my beautiful number 17 copy of the Mona Lisa. There's only a hundred of these out here. And you said, that's great. It's worth a lot of money. And suddenly you, you, turn, on, you turn on the television, you see someone selling, you know, co numbered Mona Lisa. Oh, this is number 101, 102. Well, what happened here? They go, well, they start. There was such a big demand for these Mona Lisas that we decided to print another hundred thousand of these. Start selling. Well, now all of a sudden, your, your Mona Lisa copy just went <laughs> straight down. Well, now you're probably thinking to myself, well, if these guys are going to print, I need to somehow defend myself. And that to what uh, David was saying, all currencies come to an end. I know you're not just because you talk about the BRICS. You're not a supporter or a cheerleader. This is just the natural realm here. If your ship sinks. You got to put on a life preserver because nothing else is going to float. You know, you can't hang on to your ship as it goes down with the ship. You know, you got to jump off and go. You got to swim to the next lifeboat here. Uh, the U.S. dollar right now happens to be the cleanest, dirty shirt in the room. It's a it's becoming instead of being the lifeboat, which it has been the ocean liner, the USS dollar. It is now becoming a lifeboat. And now this lifeboat is getting crowded and people are going to get fall off and the bricks decide together let's make something new but also it's also part of i think a lot of this too is there, there's this blowback of 2030 you know when the soviet union fell apart uh the united states went on a basically a country destroying spree starting with yugoslavia you know we had uh, in 19 actually in 1991 when it was the gulf war then yugoslavia then libya you know, and then Iraq. And now you've got these countries saying, well, this policy here, there's no, there's not a lot of people are going to miss the dollar when it goes because of the policies of the U.S. government. They've been so distressed. Look at Libya. At one point, Libya was a country that was going to have their own dinar. They had all this oil. And now, I mean, it's a complete disaster to the point where even Trump came out and said that Iraq and Libya would be better off if Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi were still alive. Now, people went crazy when he made that comment, but it's not because he supported them. It's because he says, look at these countries now. They're absolutely wiped out. They're destroyed. And so I think that when you talk about the BRICS, this is a natural form. It's kind of it's kind of a combination of blowback, but at the same time, they have to protect themselves of what we know is not only a collapsing dollar. I mean, they're just printing and printing and pouring all this money into Ukraine, which is what now going to expensive yachts in Monaco you're like, well, who who was responsible? It's like we got drunken sailors running the printing machine here. It's like, you know, every 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 prime minister, every foreign minister, every um, finance minister worldwide is saying, okay, now look at all this money going to Ukraine. Where's where's my seventy million dollar yacht? You know, what do I have to do to to get money like that here? So that's where we're at. I mean, we're we're in joke town right now with the dollar, and that's not a criticism against my country or my government, although I disagree with the policy because it goes back to von Mises, the whole basis of having a real currency, but the policies of Biden have really shown that the U S dollar system has become a circus and the BRICS is really, you know, it's a multipolar situation here where countries are afraid of making their own commentaries and being critical because they know they're going to get clobbered with sanctions. Look at Venezuela. People always say, well, Venezuela is a socialist state. They're destroyed. It's like, well, maybe you ought to take a look and study the sanctions placed upon them. Well, suddenly they're going after oil at Guyana. They've got 28 tons of gold deposited in Russia. So we're going to see military action. We're going to see Russian bombers landing in the Venezuela. 
but they've got gold there. But now they've got a way of pulling their oil out because the sanctions took away their ability to pull oil out of the ground. They got sanctioned into oblivion. But now you've got Russia going over there. you got Iran, and they're going to help them pull oil out. And uh, again, Venezuela is going to be part of the BRICS. They've already applied. I believe Iraq will be part of the BRICS because what else is it going to do? Are we going to call, you know, I, I call for help, and I, there's an aircraft carrier sitting offshore here. I, you know, I wanted some help here to be independent. It's like, I think those days are coming to an end here. So I think that anyone that's critical of you making any comments on the BRICS really just is is looking at it from a maybe what I would call an America centric angle or a Western centric when we're, the reality is gold has no borders and gold has is not you know it's not it's not conducive to just being relegated to just a Western economy. Our Western system is collapsing. We have run the the car has running out of gas. We're sputtering, and the last thing we have left now is um, military projection. And we have more events coming here. And of course, when that happens, that's that we're, the the United States government and the Fed and is stuck between a rock and a hard place. The minute they react militarily, boom, they gold and silver go straight up, and that's bombs are going to move markets here. So it's really it's a um, it's a tough situation here, and people really have to be objective here on how they look at economies, foreign policies, and people really need to look at what is this country, what is the US dollar meant for the last 20, 30 years for governments? Well, just take a look at what's happened. People, there are scores that are gonna be settled here. I mean, there's probably over a million Iraqis dead. What have they gotten out of this here? We're with trillions and trillions in endless wars here. And not now, basically the chickens are coming home to roost. Gold is king, so, silver is king on steroids. You know, and um, it's the time for change. At one point, the British pound was the currency of the world, you know, and it naturally changed to the dollar here. So next here is going to be, I think it's, I think it's going to be a, a multi-currency BRICS transactional system where they can trade in the, I hear this all the time. The verbiage says local currency, which means, you know, I'm China, I'm Z says, I'm going to buy uh, Saudi oil. You're going to buy in Russian rials through a digital exchange system here. So I don't really see, a, I don't see a BRICS dollar, maybe there is down the road, but I see it more as an exchange system where they can digitally transact it and convert it there instantly, as opposed to throwing a BRICS dollar to compete against the dollar. Because once that system goes, the dollar is just out of the picture here. And what's left? I mean, is it gonna be the sanctions billy club? Yesterday, the United States announced that they're gonna have military exercises in Guyana. Six hours earlier, Venezuela decided they're going to invade this area called Guyana. Why? There's eight million barrels of oil out there. So we got we got we got some more military theaters opening here, and this is this is where we're at. Where the only reaction is going to be militarily, and that is going to push gold and silver higher and higher and higher, despite what they report on CNBC. Because you know, inflation's way higher. Everything's worse. I, I was at the mall the other day, and. Uh, Friday afternoon should be Christmas ghost town. I was like, over there. I was at fashion Island mall in Newport beach. Like where is everybody? You know, <laughs> I go check the bar. Well, they're all drinking. <laughs> Nobody's shopping, <laughs> you know? So, so, you know, again, what you, what you're saying regarding the bricks, I think everyone should look at that objectively. Math doesn't lie. They're printing these Mona leases, you know, till the cows come home to pay for what, <laughs> you know, well, I went, I went and jumped on Zelensky's yacht. There was a whole stack of Mona Lisa's in there. And you're like, well, I paid so much for mine. It's worth nothing now. It's worth so much less. I mean, in a nutshell, that's really what's happening. You talk about Guyana or Guyana. And a friend of mine sent me yesterday this from the U.S. Embassy in Guyana. And yes, that's it right there. Southcom blocked fly over Guyana. And the other thing you said about uh, Libya, um, and uh, how they got rid of Gaddafi. I mean, Libya was, I think, uh, the uh, had the highest income per capita in Africa, and now it's yeah, like it a is. it's a failed state. There's like two states. But uh, I, sorry, I, I wanted to ask David um, before we wrap up uh, what you think uh, will happen as we come into Christmas and the New Year. How fast do you think this is going to like accelerate 
uh, the the demise of the petrodollar and the the rise of the the BRICS dealing in their own currencies. And yeah, have you got like some kind of time frame? I know it's a difficult question, but I mean, if it's not going to happen soon, when will it happen? That's the way I see it. Yeah, I will just give you my two cents for the end of the year, Mario. I mean, I don't think a lot will happen, although, you know, one bomb could change everything instantly. So <clears throat> something would occur in the in the Persian Gulf between now and the end of the year, obviously it would have a huge impact. I don't think, I don't expect that. What I do see is the longer term trend is a big shift. Everything we've talked about on your show today is a shift from the U.S. dollar holding on to kind of its last fingernail and it's the fingernail is breaking. And we're moving into 2024 where we'll see a move into gold like we've never seen before. It will accelerate at some point point i don't expect it i think we'll see a pretty good move into january actually and we may go all the way into march could even go longer and then i think we'll back off so i think we're going to surge in there because everything we've outlined today with you and then we are just going to see a new base where 2000 is support i know it's under that today as we speak but 2000 support and we move up from there and i'm looking for like at least 2500 dollars gold in u.s dollar terms in 2024. And the BRICS, again, are just doing something that's a natural outcome of the demise of a currency. This is not a conspiracy. It's just like-minded individuals in different countries getting together to basically help their people mitigate what's coming. Because, you know, when goods don't cross borders, bombs do. And when you can run everything by a printing press or making Mona Lisa's, as John's analogy, and suck the real wealth out of all these countries for so long, they can only take it for so long before they say, hey, enough is enough. We're starting our own you know, group that's going to mitigate the issue. So I'm very bullish longer term. I think that the next leg up in a three leg up market has started and will continue through 2024, go into 2025 and maybe peak in 2026. That's my best guess, but I'm pretty darn confident that 2024 will be very good for precious metals investors across the board, meaning physical, even futures, but primarily miners, because the miners are the most undervalued asset class in the stock exchange right now. And there's really no reason for them to be there other than Everybody in the sector is pretty much given up. It's called capitulation. So bullish, not extremely bullish. And um, also one last thing, Mario, and I'll give it back. And that's where are the ABCDs going to go? I still believe that the asset-backed digital currencies will start to take more and more favor as this whole crypto realm starts to readjust to reality. So that's it. <clears throat> uh, John, uh I'll uh, leave it to you to to tell the viewers what do you think your final thoughts for the end of the year and next year. I think uh, the end of the year right now, I think Christmas parties in the crypto se section is going to be, what are we going to do if all these cryptos go away? And they're going to say, mining stocks in 2024. <laughs> I think the entire herd is going to say, well... <laughs> I think that guy Perez on Silver's Money was right. Because I tell all my people, all these crypto people, they're all going in our sector in 2024. And Jamie Dimon is going to have a hand in this, whether you like him or not. You know, I'm objective about this. This is this is politics and banking at the highest levels here. If they destroy crypto, you've got all these traders out there. They're going to they're gonna be looking for yield, but they want returns. They want crypto returns. There's only one place you can get that, and that is in the silver and gold expiration intermediate and penny stock world and that's that's where i that's my specialty so i expect christmas december is going to be the writings on the wall i mean this thing here just think if jamie Dimon, who's the head of the biggest bank says we're going to shut down Chris, crypto think of what every other ceo of every other bank is thinking oh shoot you know if jamie Dimon's saying it we better get behind jamie Dimon. he's running he's like the big guy on the block so I think he really set the set the tone out there for all the bankers like, well, 
talking talking trash about crypto is going to be really simple. Jamie's doing it, so we may as well do it. The the minute now I've said this in the past, uh, JP Morgan has enough silver to back their own silver coin. I I did I posted a post on LinkedIn once. I did a story on how JP Morgan is going to launch a digital back coin. Back in 2017, I did this, and uh, they're going to back their JP Morgan coin with the silver they have that they have. I mean, they're ready to go. Billion ounces of silver, JP Morgan coin. Let's put them together and rock and roll here. We can't do it. Get rid of crypto first. All right. Get rid of crypto. Now put it inside. I mean, this is a scenario. That post I posted on there on LinkedIn lets you look at their metrics. I think I had 426 JP Morgan employees visited my LinkedIn feed in one day after putting that out there because I did the work on that. And I said, well, it would make sense if JP Morgan had a Litecoin. They, we'll just buy the technology from Litecoin, put our silver in it, and then hit the go button. But let's get rid of crypto first here. Because, you know, these things take years to do. A lot of people think these things take a year or two. These are massive undertakings here. So I think for December, the crypto, after yesterday's group, I think Jamie Dimon pretty much has set in motion here the conversation that, you know, I would make it illegal. Meanwhile, the talk is Bitcoin ETF, Bitcoin ETF. Well, applying for an ETF is not the same as getting an ETF. Anybody can apply, you know, for an ETF. So we've got a lot of people that that may get rug pulled in Bitcoin. Wouldn't be surprised, you know, 69,000 down, back down. But I've always said the goal, my call for Bitcoin is 4,200 Bitcoin. And, uh, but in this case, I think the conversation for the end of the year in the crypto space is going to be where are we going to go in 2024 they're going to they have to be, they have no choice they got to go to real money here now for the precious metal space i think spot it's christmas time is usually not you rock and roll in silver all the time and it's been of course it's been all over the place but i think a lot of people are sitting down looking at things saying where are we going to go the crypto's gone what are we going to do well there's only one place to go i mean we just hit record highs for gold come on the stocks haven't even moved yet. What does that mean? That means opportunity. So I've always told my clients, I said, look, spot silver goes up first. You got to think of a big rubber band. It goes and goes. And all of a sudden that rub rubber band stretches and then bam, snap. Here come the miners on the back end. And I think we're going to see that. We're, I'm still waiting for 2650 silver. We got to pass that 2650 line here. But I see the end of the, the end of the conversation is a lot of crypto people now saying, Jamie Dimon made these statements. So the, the, the pull pushback is, well, JP Morgan's been fined $40 billion. Like, yeah, he, they may be fine, but as far as paying those fines, we talked about this earlier. You know, hey, Jay Powell, I got a $40 billion fine. Can I get some money from the Fed? Sure, send, send, we'll send it right over here. Oh, we paid the fine. You know, it's, it's like a Ponzi scheme. It's going in circles here. You paid the, so the public sees, oh, they paid the fine. Well, where did they get the money to pay that? And where did that money go? You know, it's like, because nobody's going to jail. Nobody's getting in trouble. You know, we're feeling the pain with the suppressed price. But that's just, I think that's, to me, that's a part of the silver psyop game here. So at the end of the year for crypto space, they got to start looking at ways to make money in 2024 because they keep on shutting down. They shut down Binance. Now he's saying the entire government, everything. When that stuff goes, they're going to have to jump out of that lifeboat and swim somewhere. And there, I'm, uh, my prediction in 2024 is all the crypto people who who bought hashtag drop gold are going to be buying hashtag buy mining stocks in 2024 because there's nowhere else to go. There simply isn't, you know. So that's my that's my take. End of the year, goodbye crypto. Hello silver and gold. Great. Uh, thank you guys. I, I'm going to wish you all uh, a great Christmas and New Year. Uh, David Morgan and uh, John Perez. And uh, thank you for coming on the channel. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you too there, Mario, and all your audience. And David Morgan, good to see you again. Okay. Thank you, Mario. Thanks. Good seeing you, John. Thank you, guys.